This is Deep Down, and I'm your host, Jordan Hunt. I'm a composer, vocalist, multi-instrumentalist, and self-releasing artist. You might also know me as former violinist in The Irrepressibles, as a long-standing musical companion to Grammy-nominated Libya Cheney, or as a musical and associate director of The Theodams Company. I delve deep as we explore the creative process and life through the lens of a musician, unraveling universal ideas and enigmas through some of my songs and lyrics, and through some of the profound moments that have shaped me. Join me deep down as we embark on this journey together, in search of answers to the elusive question, what do you really feel deep down? In this episode of Deep Down, I ask myself, where is my place of magic? And what even is a place of magic? It's a phrase I often use in my day-to-day life when figuring out my plans and trying to find my flow. But in the context of my musical and work life, have I been so self-aware? Deep down, is it even possible to sustain a place of magic? And if so, what's the magic key? Welcome deep down. I'm so glad you're joining me today. What a place of magic this is. I think I'm only realising this now, a couple of episodes in, how much I value this little place I've carved out for myself deep down to express and refine my thoughts that would otherwise drift in and straight out of my head, lost forever thanks to my terrible memory. So I'm very grateful for all of you who are still here, 10 episodes deep, and welcome to those who are only just joining me on this journey. In my time as a musician, I've certainly come up against trials and tribulations that have rocked my core sense of security, that music is even the life for me, or whether it's my place of magic. But what do I actually mean by place of magic? It's funny, I found myself using the phrase more and more in conversation, and I've been using it for so long that I forget when or where it started. But so far... It's been useful in filtering out what's right or not for me in life. I'm not sure it's a place, precisely, (laughs) more a state of being. The same room could be simultaneously my place of magic or my worst nightmare, depending on the context. And to a large extent, that difference has a lot to do with self-awareness and intention. Like how many people are there, what the activity is, how's the weather, what's the time, how am I feeling... These all obviously have huge implications on whether somewhere is my place of magic. Fundamentally, it's somewhere you flourish, where you're appreciated. For me, that's important. Where you're rested or energised, but also calm and confident. I guess comfortable, but challenged, with room to grow and enjoy yourself in an environment that suits your temperament, and so on. I mostly use the phrase in my day-to-day life life rather than in regards to my work life and it helps me make decisions especially when planning with friends for example if a friend invites me to go out with them one night I know now after years of experience that the conditions would have to be exceptionally right for me to say yes (laughs) because really going out out is not my place of magic I've realized but if a friend is visiting town for one night only and I miraculously don't have to teach the next morning and I've got my earplugs with me and I'm not exhausted to start with and the music is fun and the weather is nice then perhaps it could be my place of magic I do enjoy dancing and the occasional excursion into society and the world at large can be invigorating I'm not a total misanthrope I imagine all you may be gathering from this so far is that I'm quite an introvert or a sensitive soul who doesn't like leaving the house much. And I'm sure my friends would laugh because you wouldn't be wrong. For someone who doesn't have much energy for the outside world, I'm incredibly blessed to have so many wonderful friends who are so patient with me and understand my temperament and nature and know when I might actually need a nudge out of my comfort zone. But when it comes to work and music, I find I sometimes end up muting my natural tendencies for the sake of the greater good. In other words, doing someone a favour, like accepting a gig because there's no one else who could do it, or 
accepting a commission because I haven't received one for a while, even though I don't have time to enjoy it, or I might not be so excited about the ensemble or some other aspect, or taking on a teaching job that doesn't quite suit the way I know I teach best. These might, in theory, be my place of magic if the conditions are right, but I think it's that self-awareness and boundary setting that defines the difference. I realise I've already touched upon a similar concept in a previous podcast, What Was I Made For?, where I explored all the things I could have been and might yet be in terms of career and vocation, which I think is helpful as a broad stroke approach to thinking about a career path, whether it's happened, ongoing or yet to come. When it comes to your niche, especially as a musician, there are so many more details and particular aspects of a job or vocation or situation that can be refined to make it the most enjoyable version of what you're doing, whilst also being challenging and ideally not too difficult. And after a particularly diverse spell in my calendar this past month, with only one day off in February, I now realise, having been fitting new and ongoing large projects around my regular teaching schedule, I found myself in various roles, locations, situations, energies, and I'm reminded of my younger days when I definitely spread myself rather too thinly, trying to do everything that came my way, probably in the search for the thing that would feel right, perhaps for fear of missing out, perhaps because I hadn't yet learned how to say no, or because I couldn't turn down the money, or thinking, I can do that, easy. Over-optimism can be just as painful to deal with, but it's taken me quite a long time to reach the place now where I feel I know myself well, enough to know my patterns, and enough to know my moods and how to get out of them, or into them, and enough to know that I'm constantly surprising myself and being surprised by people in the world, which is the most delightful thing about getting older, knowing that there's always room to grow and learn and be surprised. The fun's not over yet. <laughs> so now reflecting on the past month or so and the coming months where I've been called upon as a teacher of multiple instruments, as a composer, as a creative arranger and transcriber for the London Symphony Orchestra and an education project, as an associate director and would-be rehearsal director staging the UK entry for the Eurovision Song Contest with my friend Theo Adams, as a podcaster, which really is my own doing, as nobody asked me to start this venture, as a backing violinist and pianist and vocalist with my friend Livia Cheney as she embarks on her new album launch tour, um, as a ghost editor and ghost director for my partner's ventures into film, where I give my notes and opinions about what's working well, etc., as a trustee of a musical charity, the Michael Cudigan Trust, which commissions and arranges performances of new vocal chamber music, not to mention as a partner, a friend, a brother, a son. I find myself, whenever I have a moment, asking an endless stream of questions. Just because I've done all these things before, and I've done most of them for a long time, and I'm competent, if not relatively good at them, am I enjoying them? Is it getting the best out of me? What is it about my unique character and personality and skill set that helps me in any of these scenarios? And are any of them my place of magic? If I get into the nitty-gritty, are there aspects of each of these situations that are more enjoyable than others, that perhaps I could tailor to make sure I'm able to give my best? What is it that I need? If I'm not trying to make money or make and release my music, which often feel like polar ends of the spectrum, then what else would or should I be doing with my time? Is this multitasking or serial tasking my place of magic? Am I a good juggler? (laughs) I feel that's definitely a skill that a composer develops over time, holding lots of ideas and information in your head to be able to structure them into a cohesive flow and then communicating them to other people so that they can play the music. But is this juggling and chopping and changing between different tasks or vocations damaging my concentration pathways? and limiting my capacity for deep work, which is also a necessity for a composer? Or is this exposure to so many different vocations helping me to expand and deepen my skills in other areas? For example, in the way that my experience as a touring musician helps me to make practical suggestions with some of my pupils, or how the capacity to drip-feed information in a digestible way with my pupils 
might help me when working in a rehearsal with dancers, where they're effectively holding a lot of information in their heads and bodies, not overwhelming them with notes and directions. I suppose what's tricky is also communicating this all to anybody else in a concise way, so people know I may be of service to them, or that my perspective and brain and way of thinking may be useful to them. And again, even though I can do it, does it mean that I ought to? Am I just spending all of my energy switching gears between vocations, running home from a rehearsal or a production meeting, straight into a few hours of teaching, and then trying to prep some ideas for my next podcast into the wee hours? Saying this all out loud, now my instinct is that perhaps I do have too much on my plate at the moment, and can recognise that perhaps this isn't sustainable, which is one of the reasons why I'm so grateful to have this space to air my thoughts, however tricky they may be to follow. (laughs) I remember my friend Olivia's trains of thoughts being described as a beagle taking a walk, which is not only an adorable picture, but also quite true, because despite the numerous diversions and tangents, she eventually arrives at the point enriched with experience and wisdom and insight and questions and perspectives that can aid a possible conclusion, albeit often a less certain conclusion, thanks to all the caveats and motifs. I'm really trying not to lose you here. (laughs) I'm trying not to lose myself. I think my question or point is that perhaps all of this diverse activity that I find myself doing can only enrich my experience as a whole for the better, even if it takes me longer To reach there, perhaps? If I accept that, okay, I'm a musician, then am I spending my time doing what I want to be doing? Is it intrinsically my place of magic? Deciphering in more detail which elements of my musical life and life in general suit me best might be the strategy to success. After all, Socrates, apparently the wisest man in antiquity, (laughs) apparently defined that our highest purpose is to know ourselves. So maybe that's what the answer is. Hopefully that's what I'm doing here, rather than just navel-gazing indulgently into the void. (laughs) Although I'm doing music in some form almost every day, I wonder if overall I spread myself too thinly, and in order to reach my place of magic, I might need to focus and commit, as my friend Anna Meredith used to say back in the day, when we were both young composers at the Britain Piers Summer School. Do I really need to start a podcast when I ought to be finishing an album? Probably not. Do I have a unique perspective that I want to share with the world? Absolutely. Is a podcast a good way to potentially get those ideas across to more people than could fit inside my teaching room? Definitely. And a podcast with its captive audience not having to fight for attention may indeed be a better place for me to be heard. Though with the inevitable feeling of speaking into the void... I don't necessarily feel immediately appreciated. So, leave your reviews and comments, hint, hint. (laughs) But let's be honest, I didn't start this podcast in order to be appreciated. (laughs) I just wanted to share, and so it's certainly fulfilling that role. We get to an interesting detail here, because in recording the podcast and sharing my thoughts, tick, I fulfilled my aim. But if nobody listens to it, or... It only has a limited audience due to my lack of promotional skills. Can it be said to have the same effect? And is promotion my place of magic? I'm not sure it's my forte, but it's a compromise I'm willing to make in order to share my thoughts far and wide. I think it's worth noting how important flexibility and compromise are here, especially when one has limited means. Of course, if I could afford to pay someone to advertise and promote this show, to a standard I'm happy with, then they may be in their place of magic, allowing me to be in mine. Perhaps I need to learn from this and step outside of my own train of thought. If I were to put aside a budget for promotion to allow me to do what I do best without having to do the things I'm not so natural at, would this be a better use of my time and energy, despite the cost? Would it allow me to turn up more fully and more presently in other areas of my life that are my places of magic? I think I might have stumbled across that dynamic when making music. For example, I generally work with a producer, or at least a mixing engineer, because pressing the buttons on the computer is not my place of magic. I have finally accepted and embraced, and it gives me more brain space for listening and the writing and the performance and so on. So maybe I need to learn from 
my own conclusions there. Food for thought. I do ponder whether I'd be more successful, whatever that means, probably another whole podcast, <laughs> if I'd found my one place of magic and stayed there by specialising in any one specific area of my musicianship to become the most me version of me. Should I have stuck to my guns and thrown every minute of my postgraduate years into being a composer? I doubt I'd still be able to feed myself if I had, and I most likely wouldn't have met most of the people I currently spend most of my time with when I'm not at home. It was certainly a childhood hobby of mine, and a dream, that came to reality in quite a definite way to study composition at music college without institutional support. I have a picture in my head of David Helfgott in the film Shine at the Royal College of Music, clearly an unrefined, prodigious talent who had the opportunity of a lifetime at an institution he never dreamt of attending. It's funny that I didn't get into the Royal College of Music when I first applied back in 1999, but then I was actually invited to apply to my PG Dip course there in 2006, by the time I'd completed six years at the Royal Northern and the Royal Academy of Music before that in composition, and eventually started studying at the Royal College of Music in 2007. It's funny how the tables turn. <laughs> On that note, in the spirit of Gen Z, no guilt, no shame, just facts, I turned down a place to read music at Oxford in 2000. No need to go into specifics, because it's not a humble brag. <laughs> Instinctively, it was not my place of magic after I'd visited for interviews. Although in my head I dreamed of the opportunity beforehand, the reality was not for me, and I'm so glad I followed my instincts on that one occasion <laughs> to go to music college instead. Isn't it weird how I sort of have this guilt of that mic drop moment mentioning that I'd turned down Oxford. Really, really need to practice my no guilt, no shame mantra. <laughs> anyway, a bit of a tangent, but I have to admit I floundered after peaking in my compositional career at age 21, which was back when I had my largest and most prominent commissions with incredible conductors and orchestras, and which was also the time when I felt most embedded into any kind of scene Though realistically, I was far too young and naive to know what to do with those opportunities back then, especially in the early days of the internet. But I'm so grateful for those intervening decades where I could unlearn what I'd been taught at music college and figure out my own voice in my own time, in my own way. Perhaps I did find my compositional place of magic eventually. Or if not, perhaps more realistically, is it a compositional safe space? I don't know. I loved the more hardcore contemporary music I was writing back at music college. And at the time, it was definitely what I'd consider my place of magic. But once I'd graduated and had to intentionally do my own self-promotion and propose my own new work, rather than just writing to a prescribed syllabus, I found it much more difficult to urge myself to write that kind of music, which nobody was asking for. <laughs> I started to ask myself, am I even asking for it? Is that why I want to write? And after a couple of years of testing the waters, I sort of ended up full circle, writing music more similar to the music I was writing at school before I ever had a composition teacher. Just definitely with more craft and refinement and a wealth of knowledge and confidence. But this question, should I have been a hyper-focused composer? I mean, would that have been my place of magic? I guess the answer is in the journey. I obviously instinctively felt the need to do something else along the way, as although in theory composing is my place of magic, back then after graduating it wasn't hitting the spot for me. So really, it's such a hypothetical question. It does throw light onto the journey though, and how important all of the steps have been in leading me to where I am today. In terms of my other musical assets besides composing, singing for example, should I drop everything and spend every waking hour singing and recording songs? For those of you who follow me or came across me because of my songs, you'd probably say yes. <laughs> Stop rabbiting on and release some music. <laughs> Perhaps I'd be as prolific as Lana Del Rey by now had I been consistently releasing stuff this whole time. But I'm not sure I'd have the same life. It certainly wouldn't have given me the anonymity to make mistakes. Perhaps this is really the one avenue I'm most scared of going down because it matters the most to me. I came to singing later in life and have definitely felt 
imposter syndrome, even avoiding calling myself a singer for years. But singing lessons have boosted my confidence no end. Is it my place of magic, though? After periods of intense singing practice, I find myself rather depleted and exhausted. Perhaps I'm doing it wrong, or perhaps that's just one of the aspects I need to accept about myself as a performer to make it work. If I were to sing full-time, would my place of magic be in the studio rather than on the stage? I genuinely regard other singers as differently able to me. I'm not sure I have that innate need to be on stage, to be seen and adored and heard in that way. I certainly feel that an open mic night where I have to fight for people's attention is definitely not my place of magic. And equally, I think it would cost me a lot of energy to fill a whole concert hall with my voice, even if they were all there to see me. Who knows? Perhaps my place of magic is a smaller, more intimate stage with no smoking in the venue, (laughs) as long as it's not past my bedtime. As I listen to myself, I realise... I must sound a bit like Mariah Carey, whose rider famously is exhaustively specific, separating the M&Ms by colour. But actually, maybe it's just that now I know myself and have already experienced most of these things, playing to small smoky bars and fighting for attention on stage, whilst a pinball tournament goes on at the back of the bar in Lerville, Kentucky, or filling an arena at a festival in Lyon or Barcelona or Oslo whilst on stage with the Irrepressibles. I've already tried these things and succeeded to a certain extent. Perhaps my problem is that I'm guessing an imagined future based on past experiences, rather than bravely allowing each new experience to be here, fully present. Maybe I'm allowing fear to steer my course. And that's a bit depressing to think. Maybe I need to sit with that. Perhaps the realisation is that Any of these situations could work if only one or two aspects were changed and that ultimately I'm aiming for an unrealistic, unattainable perfection. But the only truth or reality is in compromise. Perhaps this seeking of a place of magic is detrimental to moving forward. Or perhaps I need to include that challenge as part of my own definition of my place of magic. Do I even have the stamina for the long slog of a road of being a musician? Would I make it? What does making it look like? Is stardom or some semblance of fame even feasible at this stage, at my age, with my reducing energy levels in the 21st century with the internet, the music industry landscape having changed so much, with 100,000 new songs being released to Spotify every week, or perhaps it's every day, I can't remember now, terrifying, and so much competition. Should I give up my dreams of performance and concentrate on being the most incredible teacher? Really focus on that and let go of everything else. That's a distraction. It'd certainly be a sensible choice financially and from a mental health stability perspective. And I do feel I'm very natural in that dynamic. I love giving advice and I love fixing things. I love having the opportunity to learn more about humans by watching countless others learning to learn but I'd most likely be left pondering what if. Would it be a waste of my talent not to share with my music with the world? Does my place of magic actually coincide with what's best for me and for the world? Is it even possible? I've learned I'm an HSP, a highly sensitive person. And for all of my natural inclinations, I have a finite amount of energy each day. So how should I best use that energy and time? Should I be using my skills my empathy, sensitivity, my emotional and observational skills to do more good in the world, to provide more value and service. Do I provide value or service with my music? Do I provide value if nobody listens to my music? Is this the point of me? You reach a certain point in this train of thought where you realise there are infinite questions and so many perspectives to see those questions from. And then occasionally, a part of my unremembered history rears its head and reminds me, oh yeah, don't forget when you were a costume designer for the Irrepressibles for six years, back in 2006 to 2012. Maybe that's your place of magic. Which is true to a point, actually. And at that point, I think my brain is taunting me. (laughs) I've truly reached the stage of overthinking. (laughs) Without an anchor to hold on to, how can we ever feel like we've reached home or reached a conclusion? Even if I 
focus my thoughts to a very specific either or question. For example, should I either be teaching in schools or privately? Or should I either be composing classical concert music or songs? Or am I better suited to band life or studio life? Am I happier touring or staying at home to make music? Do I seek energy and excitement or stillness and peace? Or if I get super specific and think back to some of the tours I've done over my time to try to hone my niche, for example, was touring with the Irrepressibles my place of magic? It really depends what country we were in. Was touring with the Hidden Cameras my place of magic? It depends what month and whether it was festival season or not, because I don't really like festivals. Was touring with Olivia Cheney my place of magic? Depends on how long the tour schedule was and whether we were driving or flying, etc, etc, ad nauseum. I realise it becomes ridiculous to try to control every element. Life can be so messy and complex and complicated. And if there's one takeaway from therapy, it's that flexibility is key. And making an arbitrary decision can be so useful to just get past the constant questioning and into action mode. I'm not sure I've managed to answer my question, what is my place of magic? Or where is my place of magic? It's certainly a feeling or an instinct, which is difficult to put into words. It seems that the answer lies, or the answers, lie in balance. And in order to find that balance, you need time to process and research and think deeply and do some practical maintenance and admin and self-care rather than being rushed into decisions. But that fundamentally, the only way you'll know the answer to any of these questions is through action. No doubt you may have suffered from the same kinds of thoughts over your life, endlessly weighing things up. Or perhaps you're very good at making a quick decision and riding the wave of consequence. Either way, I hope you found or are on the way to finding your own place of magic. Deep down, I still have so much more to say with my music. I'm pretty sure that if I follow my personal mantra, then my place of magic is to make music, share music and move people. And however I achieve that, then that's my place of magic. Compromise and imperfection included. If you can sum it up in a single line, I'd love to hear what your place of magic is. It may inspire me to learn and know myself even more. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe, follow and review this podcast. And if you like it, share it with your friends or on social media. You can find me on all social platforms by searching at Jordan Hunt Music and you can listen to my music on all good streaming services. Deep Down uses bits of my music nabbed from my songs Ocean Floor and Peter. Check out the show notes on jordan-hunt.com for exclusive tidbits from this podcast. I'd really love to hear from you via DM or email via my website if any of these experiences resonated with you, and if you have questions, suggestions, or requests for future episodes. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>